This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, we've heard a little bit today about um, aggressive uh, endovascular uh, interventions for complex um, tibial perineal disease. Uh, you, the field as a whole is moving in that direction, and um, in part because of, of improved uh, techniques and improved technology, I think we're a lot more successful at um, getting across these things and being maybe a little bit more adventurous. Um, despite this, though, there still is a substantial technical failure rate. Um, and a lot, a lot of that has to do with the anatomy of the, the lesion that you're dealing with. Um, certainly um, long segment CTOs, um, flush occlusions, trifurcation occlusions, this can all be very difficult to manage. Um, what we're going to talk about uh, briefly is uh, this concept of retrograde access or pedal access for getting across this. Now, I, I just want to reiterate that this is um, a salvage technique and um, what I hope to convince you is that this is probably not a technique that you should be using routinely. Um, and we'll go into uh, the reasons on why that is. Um, uh, we've already heard a little bit about um, the poor durability of um, these advanced um, endovascular um, interventions. But uh, uh, it's worth mentioning since it's uh, the hot topic. Um, so, it, you know, it was first described by uh, Iyer in 1990, and, uh, you know, they, they had two cases of uh, field and grade co crossing of a, a posterior tibial lesion. And they did an um, open percutaneous access after a surgical cutdown. Really, um, they wetted the worst of um, both worlds. It's amazing that it actually even became popular. Uh, you had the, the wound complications and uh, combined with the limited durability of the endovascular intervention. Um, they uh, uh, represented another case series talking about doing it again with a percutaneous approach. Um, uh, here's just a little cartoon showing how you would do that through the dorsalis pedis. Um, and uh, there since then have been a wide um, proliferation of techniques and variations on a theme, but the idea is you get distal access beyond the lesion, um, you cross the lesion retrograde. Um, uh, what, what I advocate is uh, transferring wire control to the femoral access, um, performing uh, your endovascular intervention, and then um, you know, dealing with uh, the puncture site. Um, I'm just gonna uh, um, uh, show you guys a case here in a second, but you know what does it add? It really adds um, pushability. You basically get arterial access uh, uh, adjacent to a lesion, um, lesions in the tibial perineal trunk and uh, the tibials, and it gives you another opportunity at attempting salvage after a field crossing. Uh, um, a lot of times uh, um, you can end up in a subintimal plane, and this gives you the option of um, re-entering or re-establishing an intraluminal position um, after performing a. Um, a wire exchange, it, I'm sure everybody in this room knows somebody or has tried it themselves. It seems like it's a very common procedure, um, but there's not a lot published about it. There's actually fewer than 200 cases in some um, in the literature over the last 20 years. Some of this is driven by industry support, um, and the other reason is that it's a relatively inexpensive thing to do. Any 21 gauge needle in the wire will allow you to get access. Uh, and I think the other attractive thing is that it, it, in a lot of people's minds, it parallels uh, radial access for interventional cardiology procedures, which is um, uh, getting widespread adoption, um, but we'll see that's um, kind of an erroneous comparison to make it. It'd be really the equivalent of puncturing the LAD to get across a coronary lesion because usually you're doing this for limb salvage uh, and you can really um, make the situation dramatically worse if you um, fail to get across the lesion. So th this was a case that we did, um, uh, and I'm just going to briefly show it. it. It's, you know, these types of cases are probably best presented with video, and unfortunately we don't have um, a video of uh, the fluoroscopy. Um, I think that's where most of the teachable points are, but uh, this was a gentleman who had uh, a composite femdistal bypass on one side and had some wound complications and cardiac complications. We had some trouble getting him through the operative um, period, and then in his contralateral extremity, he went on to develop um, gangrene of, uh, you know, digits three through five. Um, so we were pretty committed to, to doing an endovascular intervention. You can see he's got um, uh, um, um, chronic total occlusions of um, all three tibials just below the trifurcation. 
Uh, and then he's got uh, portal collateralization into the foot with a patent dorsalis pedis artery, a patent plantar arch, and um, uh, patent, patent um, plantar medial and lateral filling retrograde. Um, we, uh, and again, we're just gonna briefly go over how we did it, but you, we punctured um, the dorsalis pedis artery. Um, I'll, sh I'll teach you guys how to convert this into a sheath. Um, we then uh, were able to get wire access across um, the lesion. Um, we uh, delivered the wire out the femoral sheath, um, uh, and then working from within the femoral sheath, performed a long segment balloon angioplasty. This is a lateral projection here all the way down the anterior tibial. A balloon angioplasty down here to the um, extensor retinaculum. Uh, and then this was our completion angiogram. You can see here the anterior tibial artery opacifying nicely. Um, we, we, um, this is a, a selective catheterization of the dorsalis pedis. We had some spasm here and infused some nitroglycerin. You can still see there's some irregularity here at the puncture site and you, you're getting plantar filling. Um, because of that irregularity, we actually traversed the lesion and performed the low-pressure balloon angioplasty. Uh, and then after additional nitroglycerin, here's the completion angiogram of the puncture site. So this case I thought was illustrative because of the way you can manage um, these complications, which um, can be um, frequent. Um, so uh, in a little more detail now, uh, how do we do it? I usually um, like to prep in anticipation of needing to do it. So uh, what I'll do is a circumferential prep of the foot and ankle, and I'll put down a sterile half sheet on the angio table. And then I'll go on and um, drape with the interventional angio drape. And that way, if you actually need the procedure, all you need to do is cut a window uh, into uh, the angio drape, uh, and then you've got a sterile foot that's exposed and doesn't need any additional um, uh, um, prepping or draping. Um, on the fly prep can, can be sloppy. You cut a window, you have an unsterile field, you prep, you lay down an IOBAN. And I really advocate using an ultrasound to, to do this. And when you lay down the IOBAN over the field, you get a lot of air that can uh, add to artifact that makes imaging difficult. Uh, um, you really need image uh, assisted access. I think the success of this technique um, is contingent upon uh, not damaging uh, your runoff. Um, a lot of the earlier reports were just under simple fluoroscopic guidance. Obviously, most of these patients have heavily calcified vessels to begin with that you can appreciate under fluoroscopy. Um, they would simply catheterize or, or cannulate uh, under direct um, fluoroscopy. Um, some people advocate doing an angiogram to the femoral sheath to roadmap the vessel, um, particularly for the perineal or if there's less calcium, and then puncturing the vessel that way. Um, but you can almost always use an ultrasound. Uh, it's great because you have three-dimensional imaging, and just as in femoral angiography, uh, you can identify the correct puncture site, a soft spot, a break between the calcium um, that you can safely um, uh, cannulate with uh, hopes of minimizing your uh, complication rate. Uh, and, you know, usually with an echogenic needle, you can uh, access the vessel in a single puncture. Um, my preference is to use a compact linear array probe, high frequency, although you can use a, a sonocyte. Um, uh, I like to use an echogenic needle. Um, the micropuncture kit is nice because you can uh, apply a check flow valve and then have a sidearm and a sheath that you can work through. If you really want to go small, and, you know, the size of the um, arteriotomy certainly can um, increase your chance of having complications. You can just use the inner cannula, which is 2.9 French dilator only. So if you think you're only needing wire access and don't need catheter support, you can choose to do that to really minimize the size of the puncture site. Um, they do make um, a, a special pedal access kit, which is essentially this with just a shorter needle and a shorter catheter. And, of course, other companies are um, uh, developing their own um, access kits. Um, uh, some people advocate doing a sheathless access, so once you have a needle and an O and a wire access, not to advance a sheath and just use the wire to get across the lesion. Um, I think um, this is probably a mistake because you lose your ability to shoot an angiogram via the foot. It's nice to know that you're intraluminal. It's nice to map the anatomy from below. Um, and again, you can still have a low uh, profile access um, into the um, uh, pedal circulation. And then crossing the lesion is just as you would cross the lesion normally. Um, some people feel that the back end of these lesions are filled with thrombus. This is, I think, a theoretical um, uh, advantage of uh, the retrograde approach in that you're more likely to stay intraluminal. As we all know, it's very difficult to salvage a subintimal tibial um, crossing. So uh, yeah, my preference is to use a hydrophilic wire, although anything, um, or, you know, people have had success with just about every wire catheter combination system. And then uh, I usually use a hydrophilic wire and then a, uh, some sort of catheter support system. Uh, my preference is the CXI only because they, they have these 65 centimeter catheters with straight and angled tips, which really makes um, a manipulation off the back end of the table a lot easier. Uh, and of course, the, there are CTO catheters like the Vions that you can run up through the, um, through the uh, access sheath as well. 
Uh, I think one key uh, is to use exchange length wires, um, particularly if you have contralateral femoral access, because ideally you'd like to deliver the wire through and through, uh, and it's frustrating to uh, get across with a 180 centimeter wire not be able to um, uh, perform a wire exchange. Um, and then uh, once you get across, it's, uh, the treatment is, as per usual, uh, you can either go sheathless, run a balloon, uh, bareback over the wire, uh, up the foot. This is not something that we typically do. We prefer to transfer wire access to the femoral sheath, um, and this will allow you to maintain wire access across the puncture site and help manage puncture site complications. Uh, uh, it's actually relatively easy to mate the wire to the femoral catheter. The best way to do it is to use a straight 035 catheter and to position it in a constrained space, usually in the proximal tibial or in the distal um, popliteal, and then you just steer your um, pedal wire up into the straight catheter and deliver it out of the working space. Again, uh, an exchange length wire um, really helps facilitate this. Uh, if you're really in trouble, you can snare it from the femoral sheath and deliver it out. Um, and then finally, uh, through and through wire access um, it was what we used in that case that we presented because we had a really long um, chronic total occlusion that was heavily calcified. Even an over-the-wire balloon catheter can be difficult to push through it, um, especially if you have contralateral femoral um, approach. Uh, and so uh, sometimes it is advantageous to maintain through and through wire access, the quote unquote body floss in order to um, track the balloon over it. Um, uh, let's say you get subintimal and you have trouble crossing the lesion, you can um, use a balloon fracture technique to re-enter the, the space. So if you have intraluminal wire position in the popliteal artery and your subintimal coming up to the trifurcation, um, you position a balloon intraluminal from above, subintimal from below with the tips adjacent to each other, inflating it will create a fracture plane and then you drive the wire up through and then perform uh, the wire delivery out the femoral sheath. Uh, in cartoon diagram, this is obviously a very uh, simple idea. In practice, it actually takes a fair amount of patience and it can be difficult to establish where that fracture plane is to get through it. Um, again, facilitated with a hydrophilic wire. Uh, so how do we manage the puncture site? So uh, after we do our intervention, um, especially for the pedal access sites, you can simply pull the sheath and um, use di digital pressure for about 10 minutes. Um, uh, always do a completion angiogram to evaluate the puncture site. Often you're, you're going to need to selectively cannulate it and inject nitroglycerin to relieve spasm. Um, let's say you do a puncture above the malleolus in the distal anterior tibial, posterior tibial. Obviously you can't um, digitally compress that vessel because it's so deep. Uh, that is uh, when you would want to do an intra-arterial um, uh, low-pressure balloon inv inflation to gain access. So you get your wire across the puncture site. Uh, inflate the balloon. You can also inflate a blood pressure cup around the leg um, and maintain that for five minutes and then uh, com shoot a completion angiogram and hopefully um, you're hemostatic. So how does it fare? Uh, you know, again, um, this is a salvage technique and not something that's necessarily studied rigorously and most of the literature is out of um, um, interventionalists, not necessarily vascular surgeons. Uh, and virtually everything is a case report, a case series. You can see for the first uh, you know, decade and a half or so, the number of cases reported were awfully small. Everybody reported technical success. Obviously, there's a reporting bias here. If you had a horrible complication, you're not going to submit your case series for presentation. Um, a lot of people don't even bother to remark on their complication rate, um, since this is really a technical issue. Um, uh, and as we get um, more recent here, you can see some larger series being reported. Um, with, I think, probably more realistic technical success rate on the order of 80 to 90 percent. And to the credit of these two groups, um, maybe the only ones courageous enough or brave enough to actually look at um, the long-term results, they had some pretty significant complications. Um, so what can you conclude by looking at this? Well, you can cl conclude that the technique is feasible, but really there's outstanding questions about patient selection and the fate of the puncture site. Um, uh, when you puncture anything, you can have some complications. Femoral puncture is about 5%. Dissection is not that common, about 1% to 2%. Um, but if you routinely look with ultrasound, you can see it. Obviously, if you're puncturing a 2 millimeter pedal vessel, um, a small dissection flap can have large hemodynamic consequences. Uh, as you work in more diseased arteries and smaller arteries, the complication rate increases. Retrograde popliteal punctures have a 10% complication rate. It's uh, more likely to happen if it's a calcified vessel or patients with end stage renal disease, which is typically who you would be using this procedure for. And from the cardiac literature, radial access uh, in the long term, while it's great for um, uh, uh, procedural success, uh, if you look, you will um, see great rates of radial artery occlusion. Usually these patients don't have significant hand ischemia because of the collateral ulnar circulation, but uh, radial artery occlusion can happen anywhere between 5 to 12 percent of radial access cases. And predictors are small artery diameter, large sheath, 
diabetes, smoking, PAD, and gender. Again, this is your patient population. So should we assume that the pedal access will be any different and should we assume that the consequences would be any worse? I think you should assume that it would be uh, some rate of complication. Um, uh, uh, you know, even if it's low, the consequences could be rather dire, especially if the sole runoff to the foot. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there really isn't much in the way uh, in the public domain about the mid or long term um, uh, uh, results about how the puncture site does. So the fate of the puncture site is basically unknown. Um, the two reports that I mentioned earlier, Montero Baker uh, had 47 patients with um, critical ischemia. They had one axis site thrombosis, but that required an emergency pedal bypass. Um, so you can see the stakes are pretty high if you fail. Uh, and uh, this more, most recent publication, uh, which was you know a third rest pain, two thirds tissue loss, had one axis site thrombosis salvaged with angiograde angioplasty. But if they, they looked at their two month outcomes, and within two months they had three urgent bypass operations and eight major unplanned amputations out of a group of 51 patients. So um, you know what what happened between point A and point B is unknown. Um, uh, and you know it might speak to the durability and uh, the benefit of doing a procedure like this in um, people with uh, um, uh, you know advanced ischemia and limb-threatening ischemia. But uh, certainly, uh, if you have a complication at your puncture site, you're going to make things a lot worse. So um, getting back to what it adds, it really uh, adds pushability, another attempt at salvaging a failed crossing and reestablishing interluminal position. Um, but the risk can be high. You can lose critical runoff into the foot. Uh, and I think uh, failed crossing may be even worse. Um, so if you puncture the foot, you can't get across the lesion, you don't revascularize, and then you pull the sheath, you really can be in a bad situation. And I don't think you can assume that uh, uh, you know, you're gonna have a 100% technical success rate when you use this procedure. Um, so patient selection, so who would I use it for? Um, and who do I use it for? Uh, really, obviously, limb-threatening ischemia and infragenicular disease. And really, I have to be committed to an endovascular intervention. Um, for one reason or another, soft tissue concerns, venous ulcers, scleroderma, x-ray therapy, no conduit availability, a prohibitive surgical risk, and I've failed an integrate crossing. I think if you meet these criteria, then I would consider it, but you're going to incur a pretty substantial risk of, um, uh, of uh, you know, if you don't uh, pull it off. And then uh, uh, for patients who I think it's a bad idea, obviously a claudicant with one vessel runoff, this is a horrible idea. Uh, or patients with active foot infection. And I put, you know, isolated SFA disease because there's so many other good ways to treat that that I, I don't think a retrograde pedal access should be on that list. Um, and then finally, patient selection anatomy. Um, it just in cartoon format. I mean, these are the types of lesions that you can almost always get through antegrade because there's a little stump you can work with. It's a reasonable length occlusion. Um, but as you get flush occlusions and you can't engage or you have in, uh, occlusions that involve uh, uh, the trifurcation where you have to steer across into another vessel through the occlusion. Those can be very difficult to manage in the integrated fashion. Uh, and again, whether you should be doing this or not, I think is, um, is something you should consider. But if you're going to do it, this is um, where it would be most useful. So in conclusion, uh, it is a feasible technique. It does increase your rate of technical success because it gives you another crack at it. But it really should be reserved for salvaging a failed integrated crossing. And though the complications appear to be infrequent, it can be rather dire. Uh, and my guess is it's probably underreported. Um, and there's obviously outstanding questions about the long-term fate of the puncture site. Thank you.